I think time stopped for some reason. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody and good morning, good day to all of you, those who are here in the Eastern Standard Time, good morning, and those who are coming from around the world, uh, good day, whatever the time frame is there for you. But welcome again to uh, the CIB Presidential Seminar Series that we broadcast from Purdue University. And as you all know by now, the, the theme for this year is Distinguished Women Researchers in Construction. And uh, again, today we have indeed uh, a pleasure to welcome another distinguished uh, researcher, a young uh, career researcher, uh, Dr. Sainthi Mukherjee. She's an assistant professor at the University of Buffalo, uh, State University of New York. And she's also director of the OASIS laboratory that she started uh, when she started her career at uh, uh, University at Buffalo. So let me give a brief background about uh, Sainthi. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee is an assistant professor, as I said, in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Buffalo. Her research interests are in the avenues of uh, developing social science-informed, data-centric mathematical models to examine systemic stochastic impacts of climate change and natural hazard events on interdependent socio-technical systems, develop risk-informed decision models, and investigate cost-effective adaptation measures to ad advance the resilience and sustainability of our communities and critical infrastructure systems. Her research is funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, University of Buffalo's uh, Center for Geohazard Studies, and the State University of New York seed grants. So Dr. Mukherjee holds a PhD in civil engineering and a Master of Science in Economics from Purdue University. Uh, she also holds a Master of Science degree in civil engineering from Iowa State University. Dr. Mukherjee has authored and co-authored more than 45 different uh, publications in peer-reviewed journals and conferences, and has presented her work at various national and international conferences as well. Her work has been cited in multiple news articles, including the CBS News live streaming, United Nations Office for Disaster Reduction, uh, the Los uh, Angeles Times, uh, Popular Science, and The Hill. Dr. Mukherjee has received the Outstanding Young Investigator Award from the Energy Systems Division of the Industrial Institute of Systems Engineers in 2021, Best Track Paper uh, Runner-Up uh, from the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers, uh, Work Systems Division, uh, Best Paper Award uh, from uh, Risk Analysis, uh, Jury Award for Best Paper from IP, uh, PMI, and many more uh, accolades to, to her uh, uh, resume. So with that said, please welcome Dr. Sainthi Mukherjee uh, for this seminar. Sainthi, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hastak, first for inviting me and then for such a nice introduction. So um, it's always great to be back uh, and Purdue, although this time it's um, virtual, but, but still it feels great. Uh, so I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Um, Let me see. Um, is it uh, working? Is it the presentation mode? Can you can you see my screen? We can see it. Then. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, again, good morning, everyone, and good day uh, to those who are not in the EST. Uh, so today I'll be presenting on the topic of advancing climate resilience of interdependent critical infrastructure systems and their deep uncertainty. So in this talk, I'll provide a brief overview of how climate and weather disasters are impacting our built environment and socio-technical systems, and how the disadvantaged and underrepresented communities are disproportionately impacted by this. So um, that's the reason, that's the motivation for for my um, research and my most of the research projects are under this portfolio because it's very important to advance the resilience of our built environment in an equitable way. 
So um, just to start with and motivate this uh, direction of research, uh, we are all aware of the perils of the natural disasters. So these are some of the snapshots from the very recent disasters, the California flood, which was uh, due to the atmospheric river event last year. Early this year, we also had a similar event. Hurricane Fiona, which, in, which impacted Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and it has a devastating impact on the infrastructure, communities. The Texas wildfires, the, essentially as we speak of, um, the, the, the Texas, uh, some of the counties are still burning, the Smokehouse Creek fire, so, uh, which has been unheard of because as we know that wildfires are mostly affecting California, but no, it's now, um, the, the spatial scale has increased. And also the time for wildfires is not anymore the fall season. So it has been almost throughout the year. Um, in contrast, uh, you know, there was this Texas winter storm in 2021, the uh, storm Yuri, which was even more devastating because Texas being the southern state was not at all prepared for that winter storm. So as we see that uh, the climate patterns are changing and that is significantly impacting our communities, our built environment. And what is happening as a result is since we are not prepared, these disasters are disproportionately impacting the low income underrepresented disadvantaged communities. So um, that is very um, important for us to uh, start uh, investigating how we can make that better and more resilient communities. So this is just for the year of 2023, published by the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic um, uh, Sciences Division, where they published the billion dollar weather and climate disaster. So just in 2023, we had 28 confirmed more than a billion dollar uh, disaster. And as you can see, there are different types of disasters, including the uh, wildfire that impacted Maui in Hawaii um, and several hurricanes and floods across the across the US, essentially. So um, now, uh, just for note, this billion dollar is just the economic loss. It doesn't even include the social costs or the, the social burden that the communities are facing due to disaster. So they are already underestimating uh, this loss. Now, how we are impacted by this event how, or this um extreme scenarios is as as we all know that um we our we live in the built environment where all these infrastructures are connected and they are they are connected for services, for providing services, and also they provide service to the community. So there is an interaction between our built environment and uh, us, essentially the human and the social system. So we already live in a very complex environment where we provide service to the built environment, built environment provides service to us. But it's not only that, we are constantly being uh, under the being stressed and being affected by different external stressors like the natural disasters and extreme events that I just mentioned, um, the climate change variations, there is a significant shift in population and migration um, across the different uh, states, different regions of the world. Um, there are social and governance issues. And on top of that, um, the most important factor is our infrastructure is aging. So this presents a very, very complex problem, which brings to my broader research question that we are constantly being impacted by the social environmental stressors and communities in general um, are impacted disproportionately due to the impact of these events on infrastructure and their failures of services. So the question is how we can get uh, or obtain uh, or live in a world where um you know the things and the and the socio technical system is much more equitable resilient and sustainable 
So this is the broader question of how do we minimize this risk of um, environment or socially and social um, and environment induced stressors equitably. So that's the that's the big question I try to answer through different projects that I will be presenting today. Um, a couple of them here. Uh, so this is the broader framework just to give uh, the, the process or, or the big portfolio of in the domain which I work is so so I mostly focus on how the social stressors, environmental stressors impact us as individuals, as communities, and um, how we can model their complex interactions and feedbacks among these individuals and the communities, essentially how we can model the interactions between the human systems and the infrastructure systems, how we can model these heavy tail damages, uh, which are caused by these extreme events, and how to model the social costs, economic costs to make uh, that could be input for informed decision making. And how do I do that is more focused on risk-informed, equitable decision uh, frameworks and models. And the fi final output that we aim to achieve is a resilient, sustainable, and equitable community in the built environment. So with that motivation, I would like to get more into some of the projects in details that uh, kind of explain uh, some of these problems and also illustrate how we attempt to address them or solve them. So mostly, uh, although we work on several projects and different disasters, but the two types of disasters that I will focus in this talk are mostly on one on wildfires and the others on hurricane and flooding. So let's start with the wildfires. So this is the most, uh, talked about um, disaster now. So um, this is um, the, the wildfire project in, in bigger aspect is funded by NSF. So the details you can find in the QR code here. Um, and in this project through through different aspects, what we aim to do is improve the wildfire emergency management. Um, essentially understand how the interactions of the wildfire uh, happen with the critical infrastructure and the communities. So these are some of the examples of the wildfire. So uh, it's, as you see, the, these are the top five wildfires that happened almost in every year. So it started with the Texas wildfire. I'll start with the Texas wildfire because as I mentioned, it's just happening now as we speak of. So it already impacted more than 1.1 million acres. It, uh, we, there is reported two or uh, more people did and a huge impact on the cattle industry. So the Maui wildfires that happened last year in Hawaii, that was a tragic disaster where more than 100 lives were lost, right? With four reported missing and people were actually jumping in the ocean to, uh, you know, escape from the fire. So it completely devastated the historic town of Lahaina. It completely impacted disaster. It was a disaster to the tourism industry. So um, and the and the losses were in billions. So then was the Dixie Fire in California, 2021, which was one of the most devastating fire in California, damaged hundreds of structures, buildings, and and they were they burned more than you know 4,000 acres of land. Followed by, you know, and then we had the Bay Area fire in California, the campfire. So, and the list goes on. But the main point here is, as we see, all these named wildfires are happening every year. So, um, it, the rate of the wildfire has definitely increased. And it's not only just the events that we see, but also the statistics and the number of wildfires, if uh, when we analyze, it has increased significantly. Now, somebody might argue that, yes, over the years, the tracking of the wildfires has gotten better. 
Yes, that's true. So this increasing trend line is one, definitely because of the better tracking and better um, acknowledging that, you know, how these wildfires are impacting our communities. But at the same time, the major reason is because of the climate change. So for example, we have more longer drought season, more severe in heat waves and all this less moisture, less humidity. So all these factors leads to a generation of um, huge pool, which is dried vegetation. And then it's interaction with the built environment or even due to some natural event like lightning, you know, a wildfire strikes. Now, um, I just want to spend a little bit time on, okay, somebody might say that, okay, wildfires were there in the past. Yes, and actually wildfire is considered as a more ecological phenomena, which is good for the environment. But what the, the, the issue now is with more and more population shifts towards the wildland urban interface, we the, the communities are getting endangered. So that there lies the problem. So here, this population shift is causing a major issue in terms of why these wildfires are becoming more devastating and causing uh, disproportionate impacts on these communities. Because in most of the cases, these communities are uh, low-income people. They are moving out of the city's uh, urban areas and settling down in the wildlands, or more uh, appropriately, the wildland urban interface, the Vs. So the the point is there so there is an urgent need to improve the wildfire emergency management how we do that for that we need a better understanding characterization and prediction of these interactions between the wildfire wildfire propagation the critical infrastructure systems the humans the protective actions so all this doom this entire domain and the interaction between the wildfire disaster with our built environment is of extreme importance. So with that, I want to focus more on um, the one of the key infrastructures here, which is the electric grid. Now, wildfire emergency management and the electric grid has a very, very unique relationship, which is a bi-directional relationship. So now what I mean by that, so as you see, if you are following the news, even in the Texas, um, as, as the Texas wildfire, the the Excel Energy uh, company, they are acknowledging that they are responsible for it. So let me just explain what happens. So when there is a risk of wildfire, so there is the, the temperature and the uh, the environment is conducive for a wildfire to take place. Essentially, it's a it's in a high risk zone. Then the utilities are required to shut off the power in those regions. So that is called the public safety power shut off. Now uh, the reason being the wildfires. Uh, first, a down line can strike or ignite a wildfire in those regions. So that's why utilities are needed by law to uh, conduct the public safety power shut off. On the other hand, so that causes power outages. On the other hand, when a uh, electric line due to you know um high wind or due to sagging of the line due to high heat um some energy line uh strikes the ground it can ignite fire so that's the reason the public safety power shut up is done if there is a wildfire on the other hand it damages the grid infrastructure causing again wildfire or uh, wildfire induced power outages. So this bi-directional relationship is very unique for only the grid and the wildfire. And that's why in most of the wildfires, although the causes are unknown, but in most of the cases, utilities are blamed for um, igniting a wildfire. Now, uh, that is a very unique aspect. And in one of the studies, I'll show how uh, we have attempted to address this problem because in most of the studies, uh, 
they have either focused on the impact of the wildfire on the grid or the impact of the uh, grid or how a, a grid, a down power line can cause an out, out, uh, a wildfire. So there is not a holistic aspect of how we can consider this bi-directional relationship while modeling the resilience. But before getting into there, uh, there's this another aspect of the wildfire impact. So this is a map with counties which are most vulnerable and at high risk of um, wildfire damage while considering the, the, the socially vulnerable communities living in these counties or the proportion of socially vulnerable communities living in these counties. So the red uh, counties means definitely they are at high risk with a higher proportion of socially vulnerable communities. And to um, support this claim, there's a recent uh, study which has been published by the Headwater Economics, which shows that uh, the in counties with the highest risk of wildfire Across the nation, there are more than 37 million of, of people who are living there. And uh, just briefly going through the statistics, uh, we see that most of these people are people of color or Hispanics. They are elderly people over age 65. They are either they are households, uh, households without cars so that they have problems with accessibility issues in case there is a wildfire. So there are people with disabilities, people uh, having difficulty in speaking English. So most of these counties, uh, as we see, there are more um, proportion of people who are underrepresented and disadvantaged. So um, that's, that creates a even more difficult problem uh, to address. So overall, um, I'll, I'll kind of discuss three projects uh, in this domain. One is how we can better predict the wildfire spread more efficiently, but at a lesser computational expense. Now, why um, I mentioned that is most of the wildfire spread models are for single wildfires. So they do not focus too much on, okay, how the risk paradigm in a region might change. And also they are physics-based models. So to run these models, it takes a long time. It's very computationally intensive. So what we explored in this project is how we can use different machine learning approaches and with the existing data that we have, can we come up with the approach for a good predictive model for the wildfire spread? The second project is more focus, focusing on how uh, to better understand the interactions of the critical infrastructure, of, that is the grid in this case, with the wildfire. As I mentioned, how I'll show how we consider the bi-directional uh, relationship or the interactions of these disasters with the grid. And finally, um, we'll, we'll see another project where we explored how to come up with a systematic approach to understand the disproportionate impacts of the wildfire on the disadvantaged communities. So with that, uh, the first project is more uh, a focus on how we efficiently predict the wildfire spread. Um, Sorry, so this is the framework. Uh, this is already a paper which is published. So if you're interested more in the details of the models, uh, uh, please feel free to use the QR code, uh, which will take you to the published paper. But uh, just to give a brief idea about the different stages or the phases of models we used is it, this, this project was a data-driven project. So uh, a majority of the effort was spent in data collection and pre-processing, which I'll go in a bit. Um, so we had to collect data from multiple sources with multiple spatio-temporal resolution uh, to get to the final data set, um, essentially develop that um, database, which can be then used for uh, training our machine learning models. And um, so the training of the machine learning models 
and also selection of this model, se selection of the predictor variables is what is included or um, explained in the phase two of this framework. And the final phase is more the inference and the model performance and how we can use this model for better decision making. So for this, we focused on the state of California, it being, uh, you know, the top in terms of um, experiencing wildfires and at a higher risk of wildfires in general. So uh, we collected data for about 15 years on how many acres was burned by individual wildfires. And so this is the distribution. And as you see that it's, it's pretty heavy tailed distribution and uh, right skewed. So to, we had to convert that uh, to a logarithmic scale to get a more even distribution for better performance of our models and better understanding of what is going on with the data set. So with the data, so this is the data integration part. As you see, it's it's um, it's a lot of rasters. So this these are what uh, it, the, this, these are like grid level uh, or sale based information on various aspects. So we collected data on the land cover, drought, the, the weather conditions, temperature, topography, and all this information actually was 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 collected at um, raster level. Um, the the ras each of these rasters for the weather. Uh, and for uh, the drought was, uh, some of them was at hourly scale, some of them was weekly scale, some annual. So as you see, there is a lot of variations in the, in the spatiotemporal scale. So that's why another reason for using a raster-based analysis was we could uh, kind of join or interconnect each of these rasters and get information at the very uh, granular cell level. So that's where we, um, that's how we integrated our data. But since our analysis was county level, that is, you know, the acres burnt mostly, which was our uh, variable of interest, was at county level, we had to integrate this information over this aerial um, raster uh, and aggregate that at county level. So um, the details are there in the paper. I'm not going too much into there, but um, these are the various um, algorithms, the ma machine learning algorithms that we trained on the data, and we had to do what we started with almost more than 250 predictor variables. So that was a huge dimensional data. So we had to um, get it down where it, we could infer from the data as well. So we did several um, subsets of the data. We used several approaches by using the different statistics that we got from the raster integration, the percentile methods. We used extremes of these variables. We used... Um, principal component analysis for dimension reduction. We use correlation screening. So all these processes were pretty um, intense, but at the end, and we used all these subsets for training our model just to see which one performs better. So when we see and compare these models, we see that the, the first uh, graph is on, is presented uh, based on the goodness of fit of the model. And the, the second plot is the out of sample predictive accuracy. So we selected the model based on the bias variance trade-off so that we get a more generalized model here. And um, as we see from this data, we ended up having two candidate models. One is the random forest, which is given in red. And the other one is the extreme gradient boosting, which is in um, green. So both of these models uh, perform pretty well for predictive performance and for the goodness of fit. So we were not quite sure uh, which one to select. So we proceeded with that and did further analysis to understand which model offers better insights on the data. So 
For our final model selection, we compared the two models from two aspects. First, we collected the data from uh, 2001 to 2015, but we trained and uh, validated our models essentially on the data from 2001 to 2014. We didn't touch the 2015 data because we wanted to use that as a validation set and see how our prediction uh, how the prediction can pick up the real patterns in the data essentially so this is the this is our model and how it worked on the the holdout or the data that we didn't use for the modeling purpose and here we see that the the xgb which is the extreme gradient boosting actually closely follows the patterns of the observation the real observations in which is presented uh, by this red curve uh, than the random forest they are pretty close but what we observed is in most of these cases, both of these models, they perform pretty well in capturing the trend, but what they cannot capture are some of the extreme events, some some of the dips and some of the, you know, uh, it's, it's more which is not following a trend. And that is always a case for disaster data because it's extreme event, we want to err on uh, the side of more caution. We want to essentially overestimate our uh, models so so that you know we are not uh, too much into uh, we are not taking risk too much in there so that's what we actually saw that most of these models are actually uh, overestimating a little bit which is good because it's um, essentially it would help in a conservative design of the system also, when we compared the different variable importance plots, we saw that the, the, the gradient boosting was giving a much clearer understanding of which variables were more important um, over the others compared to the random forest uh, model, which is explained uh, by this red plot. So we selected uh, XGB as our final model and proceeded with the inference that would help us in decision making. So this is the variable importance plot, essentially the ranking of the variables, what are the key predictors which impact the wildfire spread or the extent of the wildfire spread. So just to focus on the first two, which explain that the temperature is, uh, not the temperature per se, but the deviation in the temperature in the quant in the third quantile or the second quantile, they are the most important. Now, the third third quarter or the second quarter means the season. So the third quarter is the fall season, and the second quarter is the summer season. And we integrated the data in a way so that it can capture the seasonal signals. So that's where we found that those two variables are extremely important for predicting the wildfire spread. And not only that, with the increase of this deviation or this change in temperature, the, the fire spread is increasing or the risk of fire spread is increasing. So that's how uh, we inferred for all the variables. And in summary, what we found is among the geophysical factors, like which are more related to the weather and meteorological factors, we found that surface temperature, wind gust, land cover, vapor pressure, um, and the other variable like boundary layer height, which is also uh, one of the factors that affect wildfires, they were extremely important and impactful for the spread of the wildfire. On the other hand, we considered the different anthropological factors like number of mobile homes or number of structures present in that area, population density and others. The, only variable that came up to be significant was population density. So the, the, the housing or the types of housing didn't play a role in the spread of the wildfire in this case. So with that, so that was, um, you know, that, so this, this project uh, led a, a good uh, 
pathway for us to show how we can predict uh, the wildfires that can help in better preparedness. Uh, so the second one is more, um, this project is more focused on how we can model the bi-directional relationship. So this, this paper is under second review in the European Journal of Operations Research, So, but we have this, the draft uh, version on the ArcSeed. So I've provided the QR code there um, for details of the paper. But just to get into uh, the context, what, um, how we want to model this aspect is we want to focus both on the capital investment and on the operations investment. So the capital investment essentially for the grid in context of a wildfire includes the pre-disaster hardening, which includes, okay, poor replacement or, you know, reinforcement of other structures, installation of automation equipment, more sensors or not, whether we should cover the conductor in installations, the tree trimming, whether we want to do some undergrounding of the sections or not. So all these plannings are done way before a disaster happens just to harden the infrastructure. So then there is this phase when the extreme event happens where you are this it goes through the entire cycle of uh, managing this extreme event or the emergency management of the grid. And in the post disaster recourse, one of the recourse is microgrid formation, like you isolate the grid in different islands so that the, the power outage cannot cascade through the network. On the other hand, the operational strategies for um, grid resilience enhancement for wildfires is the one that I mentioned about the public safety power shutoff. So the public safety power shutoff, or in short, the PSPS, is um, so there is a whole lot of planning that goes on, and the entire plan uh, has to be in place. But it goes through different stages. So first stage is we have to assess whether uh, the fire ignition condition is uh, appropriate or not. So what it includes is the weather and the fuel condition. Then how do you classify the areas like in based of high risk, moderate and low risk? And then you decide whether to perform PSPS or not. So uh, the problem statement, as I briefly mentioned here, is this, it's a three-level problem where there's a pre-disaster hardening decision. In the second level, there is the based on the wildfire spread, how the, how the grid can be affected. And based on these two decisions, how the post-disaster recourse can be taken. So that's the more the innermost level. So to uh kind of give you more details about that the top level would include all the hardening decisions like whether to harden a uh, component of the grid or not whether to conduct psps or not and all this includes whether how much budget you have so you have a budget of like high budget scenario and it can be low budget uh, scenarios the second level is based on the wildfire. So here in modeling uh, this problem, we said that, okay, wildfire has a brain and it wants to impact the grid in the worst possible way. Now, why we selected the worst possible way, we wanted to are again on the side of caution and come up with a more conservative design, but this can be changed to more realistic uh, uh, spread of a wildfire. So to do that, we came up with a you know um, mixed integer programming and using the existing um, and tools called the flam map, we got the fire spread parameters and then in including some publicly available data on moisture, fuel moisture and weather data, we generated this worst case wildfire ignition and propagation uh, scenario. Now the third phase is Con contingent on the top level and uh, the second level. And here the objective of the of grid operations manager is to minimize the unserved load 
and the cost of damage to the wildfires. Now, uh, the, the problem is set up in a way that uh, the priorities can be set by the manager in terms of whether they want to put more weight to the unserved load, that is the serving of the load is much more important over the cost of damage to the wildfires or vice versa. So this is a three level optimization problem where uh, we designed a three stage interdiction model. And this is just shows the flow of the process where we had the first stage, which gives input to our second stage. And the second stage, the wildfire propagation gives into input to the third stage of uh, where we design the optimal power flow model, designing of the power grids and so on, which leads to uh, efficiency assessment and sensitivity analysis. So now just to get into what results we got. So to uh, establish our framework, we use the IEEE 30 bus power flow test set because real power grid data is not available. So we use this test case and uh, this is the, this, the grid, the sample grid that is existing. And this is the grid that is being used by most of the research studies to uh, establish the proof of concept. So here what we said that the entire zone is divided into three types of risk categories, high, moderate, and low, given by red, yellow, and green. And these are the buses, the, the circles are essentially the buses or the nodes in the grid, and the lines are more on the power line. So uh, with that, we created four scenarios, two with the low budget scenario, but the priorities of the two scenarios, the priority one was to serve load, and the second was to minimize the damage. Same for the high budget scenario. So one priority was to minimize the answer of load and the second was to minimize the uh, damage of the infrastructure. So for the four scenarios, we got four results. But just to um, keep an eye on the time, I'll just focus on the specific results that we had when we had the low budget. So with the low budget, the first result that we had that no areas are shut off, like no areas uh, we conduct power safety power shut off because the load serving prior was the most priority. But in that case, if you see there are significant number of lines which were interdicted by the wildfire. So the damage to the grid was significant. And since the cost to the ignition was also low, the fire started in three different cells. So that's the worst case wildfire scenario. With the, the second case where we had a, a priority to protect the grid, so it, our model showed that you should conduct PSPS in the high and moderate risk areas because, uh, because you have to protect more lines. And we see that there's a significant reduction in the number of lines which are interdicted, uh, but the load serve also, uh, it's almost similar. So it's definitely a better scenario over the other when you have low budget. On the other hand, for high budget scenario, when again, load serving is considered to be the most important one, there was no power shut off. It recommended that it sh you should have no PSPS and you should have 20 lines are protected. But the load serve, if you see it's like increased to 98.5% with 11 lines just interdicted. So definitely if with more budget, we need more budget to protect our grid. And this is uh, a proof of that. And with the high bu budget, the fourth scenario where the grid protection was more important, then we had, uh, you should do PSPS in the high and moderate risk areas. But what you can save is you can save the number of lines that got interdicted. So you can save on the capital investment, although your operation cost will be more because only 77.5% of the load is served. So um, with that, our key findings are in a low budget scenario, um, we found that the PSPS should be conducted in only high and moderate risk areas. 
and also protecting of the grid should be prioritized. Um, but in high budget scenario, if the load serving is prioritized, then higher budget should be allocated for hardening of the grid infrastructure. PSPS may not be conducted um, to maximize the load served. So uh, that's the that's the framework, but this is a novel work in the sense it, it includes uh, the bi-directional relationships and the interactions between the wildfire and the grid. And this is again, an ongoing work where we are trying to incorporate the social component into our uh, our model. So the third one is more on the social aspect where um, our objective was to see how well a community can recover from a wildfire induced impact. And because as you see from this graph, it's the, the risk of wildfire impacting these communities and the number of properties which are at significant risk is extremely high. Right, so it with recent increases in wildfire, there has to be more manage, managerial um, efforts to focus on this disadvantaged communities. So just to motivate this, I'll focus on two types of wildfires that happen. One is the Tops fire in California in 2017. It was a massive fire, impacted thousands of acres of land, damaged lots of structures, homes, claimed uh, more than 30 lives. But the communities which were impacted, they were more low income populations and most of them were left without insurance. They had no financial means for restoration and recovery. And it forced the families out of the region, led to gentrification, increased the house prices. And it was a significant uh, challenge for these communities to recover after this fire. The second one was the Woolsey fire just happened next year, but it impacted Southern California, mostly in the areas of Malibu and Los Angeles. So although it, it was significant in terms of destruction and the number of structures that were damaged, but the communities that were impacted were mostly wealthy and in influential people. So it garnered a lot of social media attention and celebrities were there in using their platforms to advocate for this. And this is just some of the examples like from Katy Perry, these are the tweets from Katy Perry, Donald Trump, you know, responding to that, Guillermo del Toro and Milo Cyrus. So they're all popular figures, if you know. And so it, it, it drew a lot of att attraction and attention from the government. And that was, you see how the disparity happens, even if the wildfire affects, you know, uh, different regions in the same state. So with that, our main research question here was how do we um, assess whether there was a disproportionate share of resources in the post wildfire recovery. And to do that, again, we used a data-driven approach where we collected data from publicly available resources like National Interagency Fire Center, US Census Bureau, and uh, using that data, process that data, uh, trained different machine learning models for um, understanding uh, what's going on, coming up with a more inference-based machine learning model. So, what we found here is very interesting. So I just pointed, I want to point out to two results where we have, you know, this percentage of black population in a con county, as it increases the number of incident personnel. So this indicates how many persons were dispatched to recover a community. So this significantly decreased and it's kind of, uh, flat towards 24.9, whereas uh, the estimated cost for recovery was significantly high. On the other hand, for families over um, 200,000 family income, the incident personal dispatch was significantly high, it increased, and the estimated cost was low. So as you see, the resources available for um, 
the counties with higher black population or low income people were even less, right? So this is um, a clear evidence that uh, we need to focus more on these communities to um, and include their situation in our decision making process. So this is our ongoing work. Um, we are still trying to focus and get more details on a final granular scale so that we can understand better uh, how these resources are distributed, what are the reasons for lack of adequate resource uh, distribution and so on. So, so the last one, um, I know I'm going a little bit over time, uh, but this project is a very different than a data-driven project where we um, essentially got this grant to study the impact of Hurricane Fiona on the critical infrastructures um, and the and their failure impacts on the community. So this is the team. Uh, so. Prashanja was my uh, previous PhD student. He graduated, my colleague, uh, Dr. Diana Ramirez Rios, myself, and another PhD student, Snyder. So we all visited there. Um, and the main problem, what we wanted to uh, tackle was how the Hurricane Fiona impacted Puerto Rico. So just to give a brief, it, it made landfall in 20, September 14, 2022 in Puerto Rico. It imp also impacted the Dominican Republic, Grand Turk, and overall it was uh, uh, 32 or more fatalities were recorded. But this figure, what I want to show is the majority of the, the it made landfall from the south and for Puerto Rico, it's a very mountainous region in the central, but, uh, you know, nice coastline because it's an island. So the communities faced significant flooding caused by the hurricane. So as you see, the major questions were how did the electric grid and transportation failure impact? These were the two critical in infrastructures that failed and impacted the communities. Um, how it happened and how can we prioritize the recovery and re reconstruction efforts of this inter interdependent infrastructure for a faster recovery? So uh, with that, um, we uh, focused on the entire island of Puerto Rico, especially the communities which got hit by uh, severe floods, experienced cascading power outages for days. And these are some of the pictures, uh, you know, you see how big the devastation was. And the the major issue with Puerto Rico's power was with the utility company. There was trust issues, and you can see the the transmission lines were out. The roads were completely blocked. So even if they had to go and uh, you know re restore a grid, they couldn't because of the inaccessibility. So it was a significant problem where the interdependencies were not considered, especially the restoration interdependencies. So um, we visited uh, Puerto Rico during this time frame of April, and we collected data from all these places. So all these red uh, places, uh, red circle places are the ones where we collected data from using focus group um, interviews and we had key stakeholders talking about their challenges and so on. So these are some of the pictures. And as you see, we want to focus that this area was extremely hilly and extremely mountainous. And this is where the Elinke, the rainforest uh, is there. On the other hand, these are, this is the Elinke, this is the Kagwas, and the others are more coastal areas. So we had a good handful of samples from across the, island to get a varied vision of the and the different perspectives of the communities. So these are the different focus groups. So and what we did was the major focus was to understand the community impact on one side and the impact assessment on the other side. So we developed a four phase framework to understand this. And the first phase was more focused on 
how do we essentially define the specific research needs that would lead to the field work? So this was an iterative process where we had the community-based participatory research. We contacted our community leaders there, understand the problem, but also did search the, the newspapers, the news articles, and so on to come up with the specific needs. The second was once we had the field work, we had to pre-process the script, have made, did a soft launch, uh, had our um, uh, ex the we we kind of tested whether the scripts made clear or not in our in-house with our students. Then we conducted interview, transcribed the audio interviews, and then compiled the data. So in this phase, the major objective was to develop a database, but the major challenge was this database was unstructured, right? Because we had different types of data, qualitative data, quantitative data. So the next phase was more focused on how we convert this unstructured data to structured data. So we use different qualitative and quantitative aspects of this data. We use different um, advanced deep learning AI techniques to transcribe the interviews, code them, and uh, essentially create this classified database because the final goal is to answer all these research questions that we came up with. Um, so the research question focusing on the high social vulnerability, infrastructure failures, and so on, so that we can report on the decision-making better. So some of the key insights that we got is so these are the pictures from the sites. As you see, it's a very rough terrain, mountainous terrain, and with the disaster, things got even worse. And Fiona came after Maria. So uh, the community was still recovering when Fiona impacted. So that uh, played a huge role as well. Uh, so the road infrastructure failures impacted the power restoration delays. The temporary bridges uh, that were placed there after 2017's Hurricane Maria, they all failed in Hurricane Fiona. So the accessibility was severely impacted. Uh, from the community side with the focus group, some of the key insights we got is most of the socially vulnerable communities are already living in regions which were below in the floodplain, below the sea level. So they are already uh, very vulnerable to floods. Um, and the other one was distrust about the uh, about the distrust about the recovery efforts and distrust of the communities on the government, which played a significant role in uh, in kind of delay of the recovery process. Uh, again, this is an ongoing work. We are trying to um, now identify how the social vulnerability and the resilience in indices could help better reflect the reality of Puerto Rico in general, explore more modeling approaches to model the restoration interdependencies, which can help in faster and efficient recovery of this interdependent critical infrastructure and uh, come up with more of an optimization, a data-driven framework that can incorporate the socially vulnerable communities. So um, with that, I would like to thank my entire research team because without them, uh, this won't uh, be possible. Uh, so from here, so some of them are still current students, some of them graduated. I want to acknowledge the funding uh, sources, uh, not to mention my colleagues, wonderful colleagues who helped in uh, working on this project together. And uh, with that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. That was uh, indeed a very nice presentation uh, in a great level of detail and depth. So let me open the floor for questions. As always, if you have a question, please uh, open your mic and ask because I won't be able to see everybody's hand. So while people are thinking about their question, let me start with mine. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you were looking at uh, equitable, uh, equitable distribution of uh, resources and, and response to disasters. And, uh, you know, you, you went through 
multiple different examples, the, the fire in California and, and the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and so on. So based on your uh, research, what have you found about equitable distribution? The dis <laughs> the, or the disparity in that? <laughs> It's definitely not equitable. It's definitely inequitable. So I can, um, just to give you a brief um, about Hurricane Fiona, which impacted Puerto Rico. And these are what we heard directly from the communities is in most of these cases, the communities live in very remote areas in mountainous regions where it's only one road that can be, uh, you know, that can be used to reach that community. So what happens is when there's a disaster and the access is completely lost, the communities cannot get any medical help, any other help for recovery restoration, and they cannot even um, and the emergency responders cannot even um, access to those communities. Now, this is not a problem that is a very recent problem after Fiona. This is a, a problem that's there for years. And there has been a lot of problems with, there has been a lot of political challenges in Puerto Rico that is kind of hindering them to have built more capacities. They are giving them permits to build low income houses in the floodplains for which FEMA is not willing to pay for the insurance. So most of this, um, this disadvantaged population, they don't even have flood insurance or insurance. So whenever their house is washed away, it's on them. So uh, it, it was very, um, challenging to hear from them what they have faced because a lot of the population was elderly population. They didn't have access to a, you know, like they could, couldn't even drive cars. And with Fiona overnight, and so we went to a place called Salinas in the south of Puerto Rico, which is, you know, below the sea level. So anytime when there is even hurricane in Atlantic, so the sea forces water to get inside, even if they are not directly impacted. So uh, their houses got completely damaged with mud and, you know, saline water, seawater, and they had to move out from their houses, leaving all their belongings and live in community centers for weeks. And there was no help on the way. So, and as I already mentioned, like for California, just the two cases of um, the Tops fire and the Woolsey fire shows how disproportionately um, the the impact uh, of the wildfire affects the communities, right? And we have other projects like on more on the uh, the winter storm. We were trying to understand the impact of winter storm Uri, and we observe similar patterns. So to answer your question, it's a significant disparity uh, in terms of preparedness or distribution of resources to these communities, which uh, should be addressed. Yeah, thank you. I see that Professor Ishmeli has a question. Go ahead, Beza. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, uh, Professor Mukherjee. I just wanted to say, uh, to say, not nice to see you again. Um, although it's online, um, I have been following your research for uh, many years, and um, a, a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Yes. And I hope we can see each other very soon in person. And in the last uh, TRB conference, I was looking for you to meet you, but I think we were going to different meetings. Um, a great research, uh, um, a very nice presentation, and thank you so much. And sorry, I have to drop off because I'm, I have office hours. I was coming from a class. Okay. I have office hours now. I have to leave. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We will definitely catch thank up later. Thank you for attending. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bezat. Uh, Ali, you have a question? Uh, Ali probably cannot hear. Anybody else uh, question? Please open your mic and uh, ask question directly. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, this is Ali. Go ahead, Ali. Uh, yeah, it was a great, great presentation. Uh, Really, really good indeed. So um, I had a quick question. So regarding the, the, the choice between random forest and HG boost model, 
um, you, you uh, showed on the slide that, that compare the uh, importance factors, very, very important factors. And uh, I was wondering if, if there was any discrepancy between, uh, you know, the, the, the order of the variables that came up to be important uh, in each of the models. So, and which one should we go with basically? How, how did you make that decision? Okay, very good question. So just uh, to explain, it was there a difference. So overall, the trend of the variable importance was the same for both the models. The only difference we saw is in the, the explanatory power of these variables for which you saw that graph with the XG boot was giving much more distinct the uh, kind of classification of these variables based on their ranking versus the random forest. And uh, so this was done, the model selection was done through rigorous cross-validation efforts like testing and tra training for multiple times or uh, multiple simulations. So uh, to answer your question, there was not a significant difference in the ranking across these two models, uh, the trend was similar. So that's why we, uh, that definitely helped us to select SG Boost over using this other criteria, because otherwise if we, if it would have been different, then we had to investigate in more details because it, it shouldn't have. Even for any machine learning models, statistical learning models, it shouldn't have, it shouldn't change the trend. Although the first can become second, you know, the third can become second. So there can be a little switch, but not too much. And we didn't see too much uh, switch in here as well. And thank you for your question. Hope this answers. Um, yes, yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Uh, Ali is also looking at the social impact uh, analysis of uh, impact or disasters. So, uh, you know, uh, that I'm sure this was quite interesting presentation for him as well. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so again, while people are thinking, let me interject my question. I don't get time otherwise. So <laughs> uh, you, you were talking about, you know, particularly wildfire, and, and we have seen wildfire having an impact on uh, California and other uh, impacted states quite a bit, uh, and more so in the recent recent past. And I was wondering that, you know, uh, in your research, have you explored what has been the code changes required or impact of code on uh, some of these, uh, uh, not only housing, but also other infrastructure related issues? So that's a very good question. I haven't focused much on housing on my part, but uh, we have our colleague, Dr. Nigar um, Korasani here at UB, who works more on the building aspects of uh, the wildfire impacts. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of overall infrastructures, for example, the grid, as I mentioned, so we don't have any specific codes for the grid, right? And so what we need for essentially incorporating the risk in from decision-making or resilience and enhancement of this infrastructure is we need to account for the evolving uh, risk paradigm uh, where these in infrastructures are situated. For example, under climate change, some of the regions probably are facing wildfires more often, right? So they should be categorized more in a high risk zone rather than if we generally what we are using now is more of a static wildfire risk map which was, which was generated in you know mid 1900s or in 1980s so it do not capture the dynamic uh, or the dynamics of the wildfire while accounting for the climate change so definitely for planning purpose for resilience planning or kept, um, the capital investment, all these things need to be considered, which is not considered now. And that's why we, you know, this was an effort from our side to explore how things need to be uh, more like, you kind of how the decision making needs to be done more systematically. For example, the bi-directional relationship is not even considered, right? So there are only piecemeal in, information everyone knows that it's a problem but nobody addresses that and that's one of the reasons even now you know the texas wildfire which just started 
you know, now the Excel energy is taking responsibilities probably because of them. But then you should have a planning accordingly, like in high risk or high risk wildfire zones, probably you need to make the grid underground, right? Or some sections of the grid underground or protect them in some way that you do not have a down power line. Now, the major question comes is, okay, the budget, right? Who would pay for it? So then it goes to a very complicated um, sequence of decisions and, you know, very complex pool of decision makers and things get stalled. Um, so yes, there needs to be a lot of effort, even at the policy side, at the governmental side, to address these issues and help uh, make the infrastructures more resilient. True, true, yeah. Yeah, cost is a big factor in that decision, for sure. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Please open your mic and, and ask. I'm not able to see everybody if you raise your hand. So please just open your mic. Uh, so if I may, I have I have a yeah. Problem. Go ahead, Ali. So uh, I really like the, the last part where you said that you were using um, you know basically text data and uh, using news scraping tools. So I was wondering uh, if there was any you know published paper that uh, that you have already published on uh, how to classify the information that you have obtained uh, from uh, news scraping. Very basically. good question. We are in the process of that. So we uh, are yeah. actually, uh, we have finished the analysis and now we are in the process of uh, kind of publishing uh, that or submitting that to a journal. So as soon as it's done, I'll, I'll, I, I can send you a draft copy of that. That would be great. Looking forward to that. Sure. And and I follow another question would be um, so what is the the spatial resolution of uh, of different layers for for wildfire analysis like uh, the for the very first part of your presentation you mentioned that uh, you you used different data data sources and uh -huh. then what is the finest uh, level of spatial resolution is it the zip code county yeah. level or is it census bureau. So uh, the different data sets at different spatial levels. So as I mentioned for uh, the wildfires, it was more county level information on the areas born. But for the meteorological data where we collected data at raster le level, it was more at grid level. So, and you can get even finer information on wildfire, which is 500 meters by 500 meters, which is more by the mode is satellite. So they, those are satellite images. Uh, so you can get to a much more granular level as well. But for that study, we had a variety or a wide range of spatial scales for the various types of data sets, because, you know, for example, Census Bureau data is available at that point was county level, right? The 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 acres born that we used was also county level. One of the reason for that we wanted to have a broader understanding of how decisions are made and how the risk paradigm changes across these counties. Um, but you know, one can go more deeper as well if data is available. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we we have uh, we are running out of time, but I have one question that I want to ask is uh, my last question. And that is that, uh, Santi, you know, you're well aware of uh, the seven layer concept that that we utilize here uh, in, in in our group. And um, I was wondering that, and, and you did allude to that throughout your presentation as well, and particularly when you were responding to Puerto Rico. Uh, so with respect to you know again wildfire and and of course uh, the grid impact and and also uh, hurricanes uh, have you seen the interdependencies and and disconnect in uh, capacities for these seven layers you know the civil civic social environmental educational and financial so of course so i haven't studied specifically in terms of this seven different categories but it as, as you see, like even for all these projects, there is a clear disconnect because there is a lack of transparency across these various 
infrastructure systems in lack of transparency in the sense of sharing data across stakeholders. So for example, the, the power utility companies are conducting their own risk assessment without accounting for how the failure of transportation systems might affect them. So they are considering that all these other infrastructure systems, they are working at full capacity based on that, how our infrastructure may perform, right? So, but that's not the case. And that's what one of our objectives for the recently uh, awarded NSF grant that how to make a more um, holistic decision making and bring all the stakeholders on the same page so that you have a better, uh, first of all, communication, better sharing of information without loss of critical information, for example, um, and how, how to essentially uh, make a decision that would benefit the communities. Uh, so that's that's the that should be one objective for all the stakeholders, which is not presently because each of the stakeholders have their own specific objectives. Instead of that, how all of them can put their efforts to move towards a single objective. So maybe having you know a stakeholder to oversee them. We don't know, it doesn't exist. For example, FEMA in a disaster situation, they have a um, understanding of the different infrastructures where they are, how they are, but not too much into depth, right? So how we can make that system much more organized and better? Um, so yes, there's definitely uh, you know, significant discrepancies in terms of capacities, in terms of, um, in information in terms of even operational strategies across the various types of infrastructures, especially as it relates to any extreme event situation. Yeah, that's what I gathered too from your presentation. But uh, we run out of time. Uh, thank you again very much. Uh, I appreciate your taking time and making this wonderful presentation uh, for everybody's benefit. And uh, with that said, you know, I encourage everybody to open their mic and give her a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Hasek. It was my pleasure. Well, next time we look forward to having you here in person. And yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, have a wonderful day. Yeah, everybody. you too. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.